Well, our guest has arrived, and I want to just give a brief introduction, and then we'll invite him to sit with us okay. and have a conversation. Okay. Uh, we shared just a little bit about your bio before you came in, but I want to just remind folks that, and I should say superintendent, <laughs> is a former I Navy it. admiral. <laughs> <laughs> a 35-year veteran, and during his tenure in the Navy, he was actually able to begin a college program for well over 300,000 sailors to be able to take advanced courses so they could earn not only their bachelor's but also their AA degrees. Um, he's actually leading a district of about 700,000 students, 800 schools, huge urban district. We've invited him to talk to us tonight about some of the challenges that he and his leadership team have identified, what course of action they have decided to take, and actually how did they come up with this set of challenges out of all of the challenges that are out there. Um, what would be the course of action and what are the outcomes that they anticipate as a result? Then we'll open it up to questions from the group. Okay. And I'd like to uh, welcome you all. So I'm Thank Karen Gallagher. Yes, we know. I know. <laughs> and we're going to actually be meeting with you tomorrow. Yes, you are. Yeah. Um, I want to welcome uh, Superintendent Brewer to USC and more specifically to our EDD program. Uh, this is a program that we're very proud of, and one of the things th this is a, a, one of the classes for the K-12. Uh, concentration, which is uh, okay. no, for individuals that are planning on a, a career, we think, in uh, K-12 leadership. Okay. And I wanted you to know that we have 60, this is the cohort of 2010, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10 pardon. Okay. 2010, and they uh, are in their second first, year. First, 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 first year, first, first semester. semester. You're in the second year. We well, have two groups here. Yeah. Oh, that's what it, oh, yeah. We have uh, an, about one out of four of the students in our program are from LAUSD. Okay. So we want you to know that we see ourselves as providing some uh, leadership pipelines yes. for you through the EDD program. And they all have different career uh, goals, but we think our EDD program is pre um, will be preparing them for those, those career paths. Now, you're going to give them a lot of information, but I have to give you something to thank you for coming, um, and uh, this is sort of to brand you that you're here at USC. <laughs> and you probably yeah, there's a big game coming up. Yes, here. well, that is a lot easier. I haven't been on the Westwood recently. Okay, well, good. We have to wear them over there. Don't wear them there. Not this week. First, don't wear them there this week. Not this week. We have a beat UCLA. Yeah, I, I knew that was coming. <laughs> <laughs> And we have a big bonfire tomorrow night, as a matter okay. of fact. So there's that for okay. you. And then we also have a hat. No, I can't do that. Yeah. Besides, <laughs> being, besides being USC, it does say the Rossier School of Education. So right. Uh, right. Thank, you. So we want thank, to thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I will put this in an appropriate place. <laughs> We'll root for Navy and root for USC. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Um, First of all, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. I, I feel your pain. Uh, my wife went, is a, has her EDD, and so I know what you all are getting ready to go through. Uh, you know, just watch out for them. Just in fact, she coaches uh, the uh, doctoral students uh, in, in making sure that they get through that process. So, uh, good luck to you. Uh, <clears throat> let me explain something. Uh, I, I spent over 35 years in the Navy, and, and so uh, during that process, I dealt a lot in education and, and training. Uh, when I was Vice Chief of, I mean, yeah, Vice Chief of Naval Education and Training, as you heard, uh, we started the Navy College Program. Uh, but we, we train and educate just about every day in our business. So, you know, fairly familiar with uh, the pedagogy and the science of learning. And so that's, that's, that's one thing. And the other thing is I did not seek this job. This job found me. I, uh, this is a, it is a old adage, never respond to a cold phone call. And I responded to a cold phone call from someone who uh, asked me what I consider putting my name in the hat for this job. So I, I threw my name in the hat because you know, I had been dedicated to at-risk youth just about all my life. In fact, my, my parents and I started the David and Mildred Brewer Foundation in 1999 help at risk youth down in my hometown of Orlando, Florida. And so I'd already made the commitment that I was going to do something to help at risk youth in the second half of my life. 
Uh, there's a good book by Bob Uva called Halftime, which basically talks about the, the first part of your life, you basically you learn and you earn, and in the second half of your life, you serve. And so that's why I'm here. So why take on LAUSD? 700,000 students, 76.6% at or below the federal poverty line, the largest gang population in the nation, uh, the largest foster care population in the nation, the largest homeless population in the nation. Uh, the largest English language learner population in the nation, over 250,000 students, uh, of which if we were to carve that out and create your own separate district, it would be the sixth largest school district in the nation. A large, uh, what we call standard English learner population, that's those young people who are, who are native uh, English speakers but don't speak uh, an academic version of English, they speak a non-standard version of English. I'm quite sure you all heard about the Ebonics. Uh, uh, challenge that was going on. So why do this? And how do you do this? And I won't even get into the fact that this is probably the most political city in the world. Because um, <laughs> it's one of the things I found out very quickly is that politics in LA is a contact sport. <laughs> uh, so why do this? And how do you do this? Well, the first thing you do when you step into something like that, my predecessor, Roy Romer, uh, who's the former governor of Cal Colorado, basically came in and dealt really did a, a wonderful job working with the elementary schools and building schools. We have the largest building, uh, school building program in the history of the nation, $20 billion. So we're building 145 schools, uh, and we're about six or seven schools into that process, and we have a, obviously another 78 to go. And so <clears throat> we, you know, so he did a great job. So that was sort of the foundation that I inherited. But where we were really hurting and hurting badly is in secondary. And that's in the middle schools and high schools. And that's not just here. That's, that's, that's nationwide. Elementary schools tend to be a lot easier. Obviously, the children are a lot, a lot uh, younger, easier to manage in many ways. But once they hit that middle school level, where they start to encounter that thing we call hormones, and trying to figure out whether their children are adults in that tough zone. And so I, I immediately said, I've got to focus in the middle, because as I looked at the data, I began to understand that, uh, you know, that's where we were getting to lose them. We were losing them to a lot of things. We were losing them to the streets, we were losing them academically, etc. And so that's where we began to focus. Now, so how do you take a major organization with all these challenges and begin to, talk, to, talk, to start working with it? Well, the first thing I figured out very quickly is that we did not have any guiding principles or strategies. Uh, there's a book by Sun Tzu called The Art of War, which is probably the oldest strategy book in the history of the world. It's thousands of years old. And one of the things you, you begin to understand is you have to have guiding principles. You have to have something that kind of guides you. And so we came up with five guiding principles. And, and the first thing I went after was the politics and emotion in this district. And, and then, you know, that's, a, that's an ongoing battle, as you can imagine. So the first guiding principle is that we're going to be research and data driven. We're going to let the facts drive us towards decisions and help us in terms of developing our policies. The second guiding principle was that in order to have a world-class education system, you have to have a world-class workforce. So you have to develop the workforce in terms of their own personal and professional development. So you have to have a, a, a workforce that you're constantly educating because in the 21st century, as you can imagine, uh, the knowledge cycle is, is, is fairly rapid. In other words, you know, if you look at that camera right now, uh, I bought a camera 10 years ago, it was analog, that's digital, and it's probably going to go to something else here pretty soon. If you look back at this, the recent encyclopedia business now is now on disk rather than in books is because if you buy a set of encyclopedias today, it's probably five years from now, they're probably, the, the information is probably going to be somewhat obsolete. <coughs> so you have to have a, 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 a world-class workforce to deal with that. So you have to be in what I continue, could consider to be a continuous learning cycle. Now, the third guiding principle is because we are in a, a uh, every, let me see, every 500 years, there's this leap in human development. 500 years ago, what was it? You were doctoral students, what was it 500 years ago? In human development. It was a renaissance. Yeah, it was somewhat of a renaissance, but it was a thing. Printing press. Printing press, Gutenberg. So 500 years hence, what was it? The internet. Knowledge. 
We call it the inverse knowledge effect. So with that in mind, you have to be continuously in an innovation cycle. So you have to be innovative. And so the third guiding principle is that we're going to be innovating. All great organizations have innovation divisions or departments, what we call R&D, research and development. And so in order to keep up with everything else I just said, you have to have something that's innovative, that's going on, that's driving you, that's helping you to keep pace with this knowledge proliferation, with this technology cycle prolifer uh, development. And so you have to have that. And so we, we created the, the third guiding principle around innovation. The fourth guiding principle is this. In an urban school environment, especially in an urban school environment, that ed education is the responsibility of everybody in that city, county, <coughs> So everybody has a stake in the education of children in this environment. Why? Why is that? Why, why would I say that? What is going on in an urban child's, uh, especially at-risk child's life, that's so different from, say, a suburban child? What's different? What do y'all think is different? Y'all know I was going to ask all the questions. <laughs> What's different? The neighborhoods. The neighborhoods, what else? Crime. Crime, what else? Family. Okay, family. Okay, all right. So, so we created, we said that in order to create a world-class urban education system, I have to have a laser-like focus on parents and community. Because parents are critical to the education of children. Now, let's talk about the parents in an urban environment. Who are they? Working class, working class immigrants in many cases, um, non-high school graduates. The lowest performing high school in this in, in, in LA Unified has 73% of the parents are non-high school graduates. Okay, all right. So when we say community, what do we mean? We mean, and, and we're working with a, 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 a Jacqueline Lacrosse uh, from USC on wraparound services around our schools to find out where all of the social services are, where all of the safety services are, and all of the charities, etc., around our, our schools and families of schools. Why? Because we have to be able to give these young people the same opportunities and the same support systems that a, say, middle-class suburban child has. Okay? So that's why we created guiding principle number four around parents and community. And we use an airline analogy. And that old outline analysis says this, that it, since a parent is so critical to the education of a child, if you were on an airplane and, and, and you lose oxygen pressure and that oxygen mask comes down, the flight attendant says you put that oxygen mask on whom first? Yourself. Yourself. Okay? And then if you're sitting next to your child, then your child. So the, the, the philosophy or the analogy is very clear. Empower yourself, empower your child. So what most people don't know about LA Unified School District is that we educate more adults than anybody else either. We educate 400,000 adults every year. Okay? 400,000. So we educate about 1.1 million people every year. And so the fifth guiding principle it goes back to Abraham Maslow. And that is the, the basic needs or the hierarchy of needs of human beings and it goes back to the basic needs of human beings. That's food, shelter, and security. Roma covered shelter. I'm taking on food because food service was not good. And oh, by the way, since I'm at USC, I can make this announcement. We just hired an executive chef from USC. Mm -hmm. to, yes. <laughs> so sad. <laughs> so I don't know how your food program is going to be out that. <laughs> Ours is going to improve. Right. We did. And so to improve food quality. Okay. But the other piece is security. Safety. We did a survey of uh, six years in 2003. 64% had, had experienced violence, 65% had seen violence, and 27% was suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, which is one of the most debilitating disorders that you can have psychiatrically. Okay, my uncle had it from World War II uh, after the invasion of Normandy, and he kept, he was in that state from 1944-45 until 1963. He had to literally live in a hospital. So if you have that kind of trauma, you have to have a, a guiding principle that says safety is going to be a major priority. So that's what we have done in terms of, of trying to capture exactly how we're going to change LAUSD and make it a world-class uh, education system. Now, obviously the challenges are many. 
the challenges, obviously, we have to, in any change environment, uh, for those of you all who read uh, uh, Professor Connor out of Harvard on, on leading change, you know that there are basically eight things you have to do. You have to create a sense of urgency, you have to build teams, etc. So my first year I've been really doing a lot of listening and assessing as well as creating all, I created uh, around guiding principle number two, which is the, 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 uh, the employee uh, development a piece, what we call you know, professional development, is that we created an office called the, uh, at least a, a position called the Deputy for Professional Learning, Development, and Leadership. And so what we're going to do now is take all of our faculty members, all of our teachers, and the day you walk into the LAUSD, you're going to get a leadership course. And then on, from there on out, you're going to continue to get trained. Okay, and so we're going to create pathways for teachers who don't want to be administrators because some teachers don't want to go into to become principals, etc. So they want to be master teachers. Well, you got to create a pathway for that to happen. So we want to, we're getting ready to create an incentive program for a lot of our teachers to get their doctorate. So we may help your program out over here a little bit. So, but the, so that's one piece. The other piece is to create an office that deals with parents and civic engagement. And so we have created that office of, of parent and civic engagement. So in, in an urban environment, what I, from my perspective, is that you have to have a holistic approach to educating the children. Because these children, if you sit down, and, and, I, and I talk to them quite often, you just, if you ever sit down and talk to them about their lives, they're going to sit down and tell you things like what the kids at Santee High School told me when I first went over there. And they said, Mr. Superintendent, could you keep the school open at 9 o'clock tonight? I said, why? This is because, number one, I don't have a computer at home, I don't have any resources at home, and I'd like to stay here and work on AP courses. I said, okay. And he says, what's the other reason? He says, because I'm, I'm, I'm afraid to walk home through the gang gauntlets. I actually have to walk through gang gauntlets. One kid, one, one, one uh, sheriff uh, deputy showed me how, uh, over by Washington Prep, how the kids had to zigzag to go home. They had to continuously avoid certain areas just to go home and how that was impacting their ability to learn. And so we're dealing in a totally different world when it comes to this. Now, so how do you get through this? How do you, how do you get the board, the community, and everybody to go along? It's, you know, the board can be somewhat of a challenge at times, because everybody has problems. <laughs> but, 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 but believe it or not, you know, the board gets it. In most, in most of the cases, they get it. So part of my thing is to get my board to go along with the, 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 the whole process. They have bought into the guiding principles. They understand that. And so you know, obviously we aren't going to agree on everything, but that's just the way life is. The other piece is, is to get the community partners to come in and help us. So one of the things we've done is we have created something called Innovation Division within the context of guiding principle number three. Innovation Division is designed to get network partners to come in and work with our schools. For example, Urban League, Bradley Foundation, USC, uh, are all lined up right now to work with, with a family of schools. Because you have to work in, in context of a family of schools because children go from pre-K, kindergarten to fifth grade, to, to middle school, to high school. And what we have found is that in, in, within the breaks between fifth and sixth and, and eight and nine, uh, we're beginning to see that some fifth graders, a lot of fifth graders, are not quite ready for sixth grade. And a lot of, a heck of a lot of eighth graders are not ready for ninth grade. And so that's one, been one of my biggest challenges. And it's all centered, a lot of it is centered around English language learners. That is a very, very, very difficult population to, to educate. Why? Because you're not only transitioning them from their native language to English, but you have to transition them in a way within the context of Bloom's ta taxonomy where they can evaluate and analyze and comprehend. So the word part is a classic example. The young people can ex express the word party, but what does party mean? What are all of the connotations? Party to a young fourth and fifth grader means I'm going to get me some balloons and, and et cetera. But then you say, well, wait a minute, you are at a party of three at the restaurant or you are a member of the Democratic or Republican Party. So within the context of connotation, we are beginning to understand that we are, we've got to do a better job in making sure that they have captured the language in an academic way. And so that's our biggest challenge right now, is that group, that English language learner group, as well as our standard English learners who are largely African-Americans and some Latinos. 
and, and the African Americans in our, um, in our school district are the lowest performing students. So that clearly remains a challenge. So one of the things I did, and it's going to be here, near here at USC, is I called for a national summit on language acquisition. And, and that's going to be the 13th and 14th of December. And we're going to focus on English language learners and standard English learners and their ability to act, act, uh, acquire language skills. Because literacy equals numeracy equals everything else. That's the, that is the key to knowledge, literacy. Without literacy, you can't access knowledge. So that's, that's a major focus. And what, we're gonna, what we have found out, especially with our standard English learners, is that it is almost second language acquisition for them. And so we have a tendency to denigrate, denigrate students who don't speak what we call, quote, pop, proper English, rather than treating them as, okay, you learned your English in the home environment, in the neighborhood, but when you walk into this classroom, we're going to speak another form of English. It's going to be a different type of English. There is no reflection on your intelligence, just because you may split a verb over here. I mean, how many athletes really split verbs? A lot. <laughs> You know, but they are dumb. That does not, it's not a reflection on their intelligence. It's just that they have not acquired academic English in that way. And so the bottom line is that, that we have to change that mindset. So that, that is a major summit that we're going to have. Okay, so who is going to lead all of this? Because in leadership, you've got to have a team. Okay? you really got to have a team. So we created these two positions. And we're getting ready to launch what we call a High Priority Schools Initiative, of which Dean Gallagher is a part of the task force. And one of the things we find out very quickly is that we're going to need someone that we're going to have to hire here very shortly who is going to kind of lead what we call the school performance piece. In other words, we have had schools languishing in this what we call underperforming level for 8, 9, 10 years. 34 of them have been like that. 309 of our schools are what we call program improvement schools under No Child Left Behind. And what does that mean? That they're not meeting all of the what we call adequate yearly progress for all of the subgroups. Whether you're talking about English language learners, whether you're talking about African Americans, Latino, but especially in a, one of our most challenged groups is students with disabilities. That is our most challenged group. And so we have, we're going to have to focus within the context of our high priority schools initiative and our new leadership team. We've got to bring in additional leaders to deal with this. So my hiring, it took me a little while to, to, to get this because I had to really live and guide in principle number one. I, I clearly began to understand that the people that I have to bring into this district have to be experts in English language acquisition in terms of English language learners. They have to be experts in urban education. That's not as hard to, to find as the ELL experts because as we found out, we are actually above the state average in reclassifying students from what we consider what we call fluent English proficiency, about 13% per year. Yet, the state of California, frankly speaking, is, is, is only reclassified as well as we are 50% of those students. And if only 50% of that large population of students are breaching English proficiency, we are going to get there. We will never get there. <coughs> so the team that's going to have to co help me lead this has to be proficient in those areas. So we're going to focus like a laser on that. And then within the context of the holistic approach to children, that's when we think that we will be able to make a move. Now how long is that going to take? Probably, if, if, how many of y'all have read Good to Great? The flywheel effect normally takes anywhere from five to eight years. Five to eight years. Sure. So four or five years from now is when we think we will begin to see the impact of everything that we're doing. Because that's how long it's probably going to take. Because the bottom line is you can't just open up kids' brains and pour knowledge in. Okay. This is not mechanical. So we're going to have to really work hard at that. And so these are some of sort of the challenges that, 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 I, that I confronted other than BTS, which is the Business <laughs> Tools for Schools payroll system. <laughs> and since we're on camera, I'll just say it this way. I wanted to take the T out of BTS. 
because of the way it was, uh, it was, <laughs> it was introduced. But I, mean, I did not. And that's another challenge. Everybody feels that, okay, well, you, you, you focus like a laser over here on the curriculum and instruction, but what people don't realize is this, this is a major business. This is a $7 billion business. That, that's, how much, that's how much my budget is every year, $7 billion a year. And so you can imagine, if you have a payroll problem, how much energy and time that that's going to consume. But that consumes a lot of our time trying to solve that. Now, obviously, I didn't buy this system. I inherited it, and which means that I, it took me a while to figure out what was going on, but it was clear that there, there were some, some, some issues in terms of the way we managed that contract. And so, luckily, I had some experience in that in my prior life. And so, what we have had to do in that regard is bring in some of the world's best contractors on top of the contracts that we already have and, and help to fix that particular problem. And it is a very complex problem because <clears throat> one of the other things, I, I talked about LA having a, a, a politics that was a contact sport, they also have a payroll system that is the most complicated in the entire country. It's a very complicated payroll system, and so we have to, to solve that problem. Okay, <coughs> let me open this thing up for questions. Yes? So, uh, we talk a lot about challenges. I'm curious, what are you optimistic about? Optimistic. I'm optimistic that, here's where my optimism is started, and, and I'm going to be very frank. When I got here, this was a very fractured community. Uh, we were involved in the uh, 1381 uh, legislation and litigation between the board and the mayor. And once we got past that, uh, we began to, uh, you know, I, I, I felt that my job was to start to sort of heal the wounds. Because I knew, based on guiding principle number four, that we were not going to educate the children in this, in this city if we had a split community mm -hmm. and we were fractured. And we, were, and we divided along political fault lines. And so my optimism is the fact that since then I have been able to forge a lot of partnerships and relationships that heretofore had not been formed. Uh, in fact, the mayor is going to come in through uh, Innovation Division and, and partner with some of the schools, that, some of the families of schools. So my optimism is that we will be able to continue to forge the partnerships that we need in order to make sure that that we, in essence, start to educate these children in a holistic way. That's one thing. And the other thing is that we have some great teachers out here. And to, to the extent that I can get to them and get them the professional development that they need, I think we will inspire a different level of instruction here at LUSD. Yes? I'm actually not from the K-12 environment. I'm from the Value Principle Number 4 Parents and Community. Okay. And I'm curious, for those of us who work with community-based organizations, what approach do we need to take to go into a school like Santee High School and approach them with the services that we have and the infrastructure that's already kind of itself fractured as a school community? Mm -hmm. What are your suggestions for approaching that? Well, one of the things we're going to do there, and that's a good question because, well, doc, in fact, uh, Dr. McCroskey is, is helping us work our way through that. <clears throat> Here's what happens. Schools have their own culture. Mm -hmm. And so what you as a community-based organization have to do is you can't come in and say, and, and come in as I call it, and, John Wayne, mm -hmm. and come, you know, I'm, we're just going to come in here and we're going to Bogart our way in. That's Humphrey Bogart. And so, <laughs> um, you can tell how old I am. And so you can't force your way in. You have to come in from a supporting, uh, uh, with a supporting attitude. And so the first thing you do is you ask the question, where do you need help? Okay, and if you are the right fit for that, fine. If you're not, acknowledge that and move out. Uh, or help them find what they really need. And so that's the approach that we're using. We're going to do sort of a, an assessment of every school's need. You know, for example, a, a Santee versus a Crenshaw is going to be different. Different populations. One is very high in terms of foster care kids. One is high in ELs. Uh, Santee is the school, obviously, with the big gang population over there. So they need some safety and some other help over there, as opposed to, say, Crenshaw, which has a lot, like I said, has a lot of foster. So you have to kind of find your match. And what you're going to find is that, and, 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 and some of this is going to be cultural, too. You know, um, uh, some of the counselors, and I have to defer to some of my principals here, 
that you know principals you know have a lot of people trying to lay stuff on them. Some schools, frankly speaking, have more than they can handle, mm -hmm. and so that's why you have to go in and find out where they are first, and then find out if you fit. One high school has 50 people and organizations working with them. They are overwhelmed. It's just totally overwhelmed, and they could not take not one other community-based initiative, no how, no way. And 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 so you, you have to go in and work with them. But if you, in, in our case, the best thing, the one of the reasons we're creating this office of uh, community, I mean civic and, and parent engagement, is to start this clearinghouse, so that community-based organizations can come in and say, this is what we have to offer, and then we can help match what you have to offer to the right schools. Yes. Hi, my name's Emily. I'm actually in the higher education specialty in the EDD program. Okay. Um, I'm curious, there's an increasing trend in higher education that parents are helicopter parents, or they're highly involved in their students' lives, which is actually accentuated by increasing technology in schools, you know, like cell phones or text messaging, or they'll call the parent right after the test and tell them how they did or what have you. Do you feel like that's something that is also a trend in LUSD, and how does that impact the day of the jobs and people in in some ways it does. I mean, LASD, as a lot of people don't, probably don't realize, is that it has some of the best schools. And obviously, we have, I'm, I'm, I'm going to just be very frank with you, we have the best students in the nation. Uh, we've won the National Academic Decathlon four out of the last five years, not 10 out of the last 19. So we have the best <coughs> students in the nation. And I mean, we, we're beating Texas and, and, and several other major uh, states. Um, within that context, that tends to be where your helicopter parents are, okay? With, with what we call high, high, low maintenance students, high maintenance parents. <laughs> so, so, I mean, and so the, um, I mean, I, I, you know, my, my principals can probably answer this better than I can. What has to happen is that basically you respond to them as best you can, um, and. Uh, and, and it, it's interesting because those parents tend to be a little bit more litigious as well. And so we find that most of our lawsuits in special education are in the high-performing school districts. Okay? Uh, and so it's just it's a tough problem uh, in trying to manage that. But they have every right to do what they do. Uh, but with technology being what it is, uh, uh, my, my wife teaches in a high maintenance, low maintenance environment. And what she does is that she, as, as a teacher, she's very proactive in the way she deals with parents. And so what she will do, first of all, email. Second of all, emails are answered within 24 hours. Third, all news is not bad news. So you make sure that you get good news to those parents as well as bad news. And then you have to be, obviously have to be responsive, responsive and you have to bring in a parent conference, parent teacher conferences. It depends on how the school leadership deals with it. Uh, sometimes you just can't, can't resolve, you can't resolve, you just can't resolve. But, uh, you know, most, most of the time you just, it's a matter of being actively engaging for the teachers themselves to be just as proactive in terms of technology as the parents. Hope that answers that. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, I was wondering, uh, have your leadership styles changed? Has, has your leadership style changed? I mean, 35 years in the, in the Navy is a long time. I spent seven years in the Navy. I thought that was. <laughs> well, I was wondering if your leadership style has changed uh, since, since you got out. Yeah, I, I don't think there's any question about that. Um, you have to be a lot more collaborative in this job. Um, uh, I think it's, it's C cube. It's not even C square. Uh, it, 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 you obviously a lot more collaborative. Um, but the good news for me, I had a good transition into this job. I guess if I had come out of a total military environment where I was just dealing with sailors, it probably the transition would have been a little bit more difficult. But my last six years, I was dealing in a um, in commands that were mostly civilian. So I, I already started to adapt to a civilian environment, including unions. I had five unions in my last job. So I knew how to deal with unions. In fact, these union leaders called the other unions to find out what kind of a guy. And, and, and in their best compliment, they say, you are workable. That's kind of what. But anyway. 
But yeah, you you had to you have to adapt to every culture is different, and so the only good news about the cultures I I grew up in because both my parents are teachers, my wife's a teacher, um, both in laws are teachers, and two of my three sister in laws are teachers. So I think I know the culture pretty well. Yes. Uh, my name is Gary Clark. I work in the undergrad admission office here at USC, and I'm I'm curious about. We've talked a little bit about some of the partnerships you guys have with USC, but in general, what role do you think local universities, uh, community colleges, state or private, um, can play in supporting LAUSD and their and their college going rates for their students? Is there is there more that we can and should be doing? Well, at the community college level, we're looking for formal relationships with uh, high schools, and to the extent possible, we want to. Uh, have as many community college courses being taught at the high school level as possible. One of my goals is to uh, get probably up to 10% of the high school graduates graduating with at least some community college courses uh, or as many as possible with an associate's degree. I just featured uh, during my state of schools address a young lady who grew up here in, in Watts who finished uh, uh, Harvard teacher prep, which is on Harvard Mill College uh, in, in the Harvard area. And she graduated with a high school diploma and an associate's degree. And unfortunately, she's going to go to your arrival. She's <laughs> yes. in LA, and she's going to be a freshman in junior status. And so she'll finish her bachelor's degree in two years and her master's in four or, or less. And so that's uh, those are the kinds of students we want to go after. We have about 300 students like that every year. About 300, that's what I've been told. I haven't verified that. Now, within that context, we also want to establish more formal relationships with the local colleges and universities, uh, both, uh, you know, obviously USC, the UC system, as well as uh, Cal State system. So, what does that mean? That means that we want those, we want these children to be exposed to youth in terms of coming on campus. That's on the low end, on the high end. We're looking at perhaps starting what we consider to be a USC Academy or UCLA Academy where you have high school students going to an academy sponsored by you. Or we're looking for formal partnerships, network partnerships with uh, a family of schools. And I think USC is clearly uh, considering that. And then because you have a school of education, we want to be able to help you in terms of your development of teachers who are coming into urban education. And so there needs to be that articulation as well. And so to the extent that we are learning, uh, as we learn, you learn, about how to deal with these, spe especially special populations. So I haven't even talked to Dean Gallagher, I'm meeting with her tomorrow. But the bottom, the bottom line is, you know, you've got to really, when you do the research and you do the analysis, you really have to understand that there, there are some real, because one good thing about NCLB, it focuses us on subgroups. There are some specialized subgroups that you really have to understand in order to educate. And English language learners, <coughs> students with disabilities, African American students, but we still have some, expect some expectation issues, dealing with bias and, and issues dealing with that. You really got to understand that. So academically, you have to understand that at the teacher education level, and so and at the practical level when you come out and do student teaching, etc. So we're also looking at creating demonstration schools associated with the college. Uh, and those demonstration schools will be schools where you know you can bring in the, the student teachers, et cetera, as well as teachers to, to, to kind of get yourself acclimated and start working your way into those programs. Yes? Um, LAUSD is a very complex organization with lines of authority. And one of the frustrations I've heard um, from a lot of leaders at the site level is that it's hard to make substantial change at a site level in a system that's so large and you hear the word bureaucracy come up a lot. What's your, your take on that, or how do you build capacity in site level groups to be able to make a change within that large organization? Well, um, I, and I agree with that. Uh, I, I found LAUSD to be extremely large and, 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 and in many cases not as responsive as it should be. Um, in fact, uh, the facilities division basically divorced themselves away from a lot of our processes and created their own contracting and procurement division because of that. Um, they were not able to pay their bills on time 
using our system, and so they basically created their own system. So now they pay their bills within 18 point two days. Um, so one of the things I am looking at bringing, one of the good news things about my training is that in, a, in an organization like the Navy, um, we began to understand that we needed to become smart in terms of business processes and processes in general. And so, again, going back when I got in principle number two, which is basically employee development uh, and leadership and management training, uh, we are introducing uh, executive leadership development training so that we can begin to educate our workforce on things like Lean Six Sigma Balance Scorecard and all of those business processes that will help us in terms of developing um, a culture that can root them. Because I can go in and dictate a lot of this, but you know, within the context of change management, it won't happen until I educate them first. And so they have to understand, they have to have the knowledge and skills and ability and tools to use in order to change the system. So that's the only way I'm going to get the system to change. And so uh, one of the things, and the other way you do this is money. I'm moving money out of Central down to the sites. But just handing a site money still doesn't work unless they know what to do with it. Okay, so you have to, again, it goes back to this whole executive level leadership training that we're getting ready to embark on. In fact, I'm having a meeting with one of the, one of the major people that's going to help us here you know, next month. And that is, I've got to get them the training uh, in order to do that. I've got to get them the business tools. Uh, the Navy started this back in um, about 1999, 1998 time frame. We, as senior officers in the Navy, we all had to go to executive level leadership training. We went up to places like uh, San Jose and went, and went into Silicon Valley, met with Chambers at Cisco and people at Novell, etc., and began to talk to the CEOs and executives to talk about how they were able to, to make themselves a lot more efficient. And so, you will see over time with LAUSD, as long as I'm here, you're going to see us moving more and more towards a matrix organization. That means that um, what I found in program improvement, which is the NCLB piece, that all of the program improvement people were where? Where do you, talk, where do you think they were? They now here we are, we've got all these program improvement schools, but where were they? They were in central headquarters. I said, that's not making any sense. I said, you've got to be where the action is. Where are the schools? Why are you down? Why are you up here? So we immediately deployed them out to the local districts and said, you're going to go where the schools are. Now, you still, I don't know how many of y'all have read the book Roaring 2000s by Harry Dent. It's a good book. Because Harry Dent says now organizationally we're going to be circular. And within, you're going to have, inside of that, you're going to have a hub called a server, kind of a computer term. And on the outside, you have browsers. And so the server serves as sort of that core of expertise that you need to be able to feed to the people who are actually doing all the work out here on the browser side, on the outer circle, who are actually in the workplaces and in the sites doing the job. So they provide you with that expertise that you need. And oh, by the way, because it's circular, you don't have stovepipes. In other words, you don't have you know, people who are not talking to each other. So you have to communicate around that circle. And so what we're saying is we have eight local district superintendents. Okay? And so what we're saying to all eight of those local district superintendents, you're on that circle. You know, you and the schools are on that circle. And the, the headquarters people, which should get as small as we possibly can make it, are inside of that circle to provide you the support and expertise that you need in order for you to do your job out here. And oh, by the way, we can rotate you not only around that circle, but back into the middle of the circle, just in case we, you know, we need to work with you a little bit more in terms of your expertise. And so <clears throat> that's, that's where we're headed. And that was my first budget decision. I took $11 million and moved it out of Central, out to the local district soups, and we'll eventually move more of that out. And I cut 500 jobs out of Central. Cut 500 positions. So, just to make sure people knew I was serious. <laughs> yes? Um, really glad to hear about the innovator, uh, innovation, Department of Innovation. Yeah, Innovation of Innovation. And, uh, because uh, I'm involved at a charter school inside the district, and one of the reasons why we're so excited about what we do is because we're all about innovation and trying new things. <coughs> what value do you see with uh, charter schools inside of your district? We will, functionally, we will be aligned with, with uh, innovation. Charter division in uh, LAUSD will be aligned with innovation division. Because what we want to do is, in, in many ways, our innovation division schools will be charter-like. 
they will have network partners who are actually running the schools or working with the schools that they will be reporting to me. But more importantly, we want to be able to make them as efficient as possible. That's where you're going to have more school site management, you know, what we call school-based management, SPM. And so, but again, that's, they've got to be well trained. There's going to be some very strict accountabilities in there. And then what we're going to do is that we, because we are going to be kind of integrated between charter and innovation, we're going to study the best practices in charter schools because you all are truly independent and incubators out there of, of, of new of, of, of innovative techniques and, and pedagogy, et cetera. So we're going to study you. And to the extent that you that you're doing things that are well that are well documented using our guiding principle number one through research and data, then we will basically begin to integrate that into not only innovation into schools but also the traditional schools. And so we've already looked at, for example, one charter that we're watching very closely right now is Watts Learning Center. Okay, because Watts Learning Center has uh, a largely African American, but uh, I guess 100 percent African American population, and uh, it's the small school, 143 students. And they have an academic performance index of about 822. Well, that's the high. You know, that's about as high as it gets for African Americans in this district. And so, with uh, 800 being the the target that the state wants us to have. Uh, and so we, I, I talked to them. I said, "How are you doing this?" And uh, of course, it's very rigorous in terms of academics. But they, again, it's a holistic approach. These children are traveling abroad. So, you know, so they're going to Africa every year, they're going here every year, et cetera. So their whole horizons have been expanded. Yeah, and, and so I said, well, wait a minute, are you cherry picking? He says, no. I said, How, what's your free and reduced lunch percentage? Okay, the district is 76%, he's 88%. So that way I knew by measuring what they're doing that in essence, uh, you know, they're, they're, uh, they're somebody I have to study. Synergy is another one. KIPP, we look at KIPP as well. Which one are you? I'm out in uh, Lynn Hills, it's Ivy Academia. Ivy, okay, yeah, Ivy, entrepreneurial, yeah. So we'll study that. Yeah. We're, we're, we, as many of you know, I brought Green Dot into Lock High School. Okay, so Green Dot's into Lock High School. And the reason that Lock is in, there's a reason for that. We have 1,300 ninth graders, and how many, six, eight, uh, uh, 10th graders do you think we have? About 500. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those were nine R's, which are retained. Now, as it turns out, we have more ninth graders than we do uh, any other grade at secondary level, uh, because um, the, the number of people we retain. And so we've got 68,000 ninth graders in the entire system and only 28,000 seniors, but we'll have 49,000 eighth graders. So, so as the eighth grade, 49,000 feed, a large percentage of them don't move on. And so we end up with this huge bulge at the ninth grade level. And if they, if a student, if a child fails, what is the child going to do? They're going to drop out. They're going to leave the system. So when we looked at Animal Green Dot and looked at their ninth grade house academy slant model, we said, okay, fine, I want to put that in there, see if it works, as well as it worked <laughs> outside when he was doing it outside of Jefferson and, and Jackie Robinson and all the rest of those places. And so we want to see if it works. It's got to be better where we're at. And so we, we did that. It was a very controversial decision, but bottom line is it, it was something we felt we needed to do. But we would, we, the whole key is we want to benchmark and replicate that. Okay. Yes? Um, my school, my district is considering having, we have an eighth grade retention program right now, and they're considering changing it to a ninth grade retention program. Do you know why LAUSD has chosen to do it at the ninth grade level as opposed to eighth Well, you know, they, they, it was in the context of their social promotion policy. They felt that that was the best place to do it. Um, but the other thing, too, is that's when you start earning credits. Um, and so from, from, from that perspective, I think that that's why they did it. I wasn't here when they made this decision. But that's what, historically what I understand it, that, that was the reason. But the key for me is that We've got to get the eighth graders ready to go to ninth grade. We're finding that our ninth grade reading levels are around sixth grade. Again, it goes back to literacy. And so if they're not literate, literate you know, literate, and, 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 and then all of a sudden you step into high school, 
then you're going to have a higher retention rate at the, at the ninth grade, and that's what that's one of the reasons we're having a higher retention rate in ninth grade. Now, so how do you mitigate that? Well, a lot of schools have created ninth grade academies, and where they, they put ninth graders through a very intensive uh, uh, academic regimen, uh, but they also put them through a uh, 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 what I consider to be a very strong counseling model. And it was a, one of the best schools we have in terms of transitioning ninth graders to 10th and 10th to 11th. We really want to get them to 11th grade. Because once we get them to 11th grade, then, then they will tend to graduate. Uh, so even if, even if they make it to 10th grade, they are not out of the woods yet. So Polytech has created a 9th and 10th grade <coughs> counseling center, what they call 9th, 9th and 10th grade counseling center. And what they do is the ninth grade counselors pick you up when, they, when, you, when you're an eighth grader and, and bring you into the ninth grade. They stick with you. They work with you. They know what your academic loads are. They know what your social problems are. They know what your personal problems are. And then they take you to those same counselors, work with you all the way to the tenth grade. Okay? And then they hand you off to the eleventh grade and then they loop back down and pick up the eighth graders coming out and bring them through. Some school systems are using something called, within the context of a small schools concept, or say a school of social justice. All of the ninth graders will go into this one school, and then within a small schools concept, based on themes, whether it's music, performing arts, engineering, technology, whatever the case might be, then those ninth graders would then choose and go out into the tenth grade uh, and and hit all of the small schools in the, in the tenth grade. Uh, that's one concept. In other words, it's sort of that orientation that they need and that nurturing that they need and the, and the transition and orientation that they need in order to make these successful high school students. So there's a lot going on in there in the ninth grade other than just academics. And so within that context, I think that a lot of our schools are going to move more and more towards that. Yes? We have students with disabilities in your district that, for one reason or another, are not going to pass the California High School exit exam and receive an official diploma, get a certificate of completion. Are you in the process of developing any vocational programs for students that are not going to achieve high school diploma? Well, okay, I'm just going to stay with them the law here. Uh, there are exceptions, yeah, I think it was the Campbell decision, there are exceptions to students who, who can't pass and, and, with the, and they'll hell harmless. Okay, so it depends on the severity of their, student, of their disability. Uh, but those <coughs> students who don't quite meet that metric, clearly career tech is something that we do. But we still push to get them through to pass the Casey. And the way we do that is we offer them, post high school graduation, we offer them Casey prep courses. Mm -hmm. We work with the community college on this. And oh, by the way, they can still go. As long as they completed their credits, they can still go to a community college. And they can still go all the way and earn their AA degree. And so, it's just a matter of making sure they understand all of that. But having a high school diploma is still important if they want to go to a four-year college. Uh, and so we just we continuously work through that process. In other words, if they don't meet the, the bar in terms of being special ed or students with disability where they are exempt, then we just continue to work through. Uh, and right now, the I think the pass rate for the students with disabilities is probably in the 60 percentile. Uh, it is 66 percent for English language learners, those who do not reclassify. For those who reclassify as fluent English proficient among the English language learners, uh, the district average for passing the case is around 87, 88 percent, somewhere between those two. Their pass rate is 92 percent. So once we get you to English proficiency, you ask the, the English language learners actually pass at a higher rate than the overall population. So that's why it's so important, that's why the summit is so important. We really got to figure a way to get them to that point. Once we get you to English proficiency, then we have a much more successful student. Yes? As future leaders in education, what do you think is the most important skill or, you know, adaptive skill that we could have going, going into this situation? Um, that's a good question. Um, when you say education, you mean urban education or just education? Urban too? education is it. Okay. No, um, you really got to know the, 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 the challenges of an urban child. I mean, you really got to understand that, okay? Um, 
and I think, and I'm just going to be very candid, whatever, you know, I grew up in a, in a college uh, graduate home, you know, was everybody in my family graduated from college, including my grandparents. And so, you have to adapt and say, and, and, under, and be what I consider to be very compassionate and understanding of the challenges that the, an urban child is going through. And I think so, so part of it is, is your attitude, okay? And that's going to be the, the, the main thing. Uh, and then after that, it's just a matter of doing the homework and, and studying it and, un and understanding all of the pedagogy and all of the instructional techniques that you're going to have to use in order to get these children uh, up to speed. Um, and, that's not, and that's not easy. And, you, and, I, and I just hope as an educational leader that you're not easily frustrated. Because if you're easily frustrated, don't come into this business because you won't make it. Okay? Because, you know, I can tell you that from my experience so far. <laughs> Yes. I, I mean, how do you deal, though, with, I mean, you made a statement that you got criticized for a lot, but I thought it was one of your best statements when you said how you know, we just need to remove bad teachers. I don't think that, that that's not exactly what you said, I'm paraphrasing, but you know, how do you deal with the teachers and the site administrators who don't know the challenges of the urban child and don't care to know the challenges of the urban child? Well, I think one of the things you do, first of all, you, you, you work with them as best you can. See, you know, you know, you know you go back to Jim Collins' book, uh, Good Break, in, in, in the uh, social sector piece, and he made it very clear. See, in our, in, once you reach tenure, uh, it's, you can't get rid of folks. You just can't get rid of it. And, and the real challenge for me, in terms of moving, say, teachers who are ineffective, is that even if you move them, you don't really move them. They call it the dance of the lemons. And so the other challenge is if you really want to go after them and, and get them removed legally, you have, there's another step to this, and that's the administrative judge. So you have to default to my guiding principle number two and try to work as much as you can. And, and again, going back to Jim Collins, and put the right person in the right seat on the right bus and try to find them a place in the system where they can be effective. Uh, and so my challenge with the unions and everybody else is to get to that point where I can at least move them to a, a certain point, but more importantly where I can and that's why I'm really working hard to get this, 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 this heavy professional development, uh, uh, what I consider to be a very intensive professional development program, uh, and try to get them to a point where I can really work with them. Now, the good news is the vast majority of teachers clearly are good teachers. But you do have some that are not effective. You know, my principals will tell you that point blank. I mean, they, they rail at me every time I talk to them about, about that. Uh, some school districts have, have been able to to work with their unions, to be able to move teachers and, and move them out of the classroom. You know, some people just, you know, they can be very effective outside of the classroom. So you may have to find some positions for them outside of the classroom. But you can't just throw them out because you're a public, you're a public uh, agency. And, and there's, they, they're, they're protected from that. Yes? I'm going back to the ROP on programs and things like that. You're referring to the holistic approach to student education. We as a cohort have had discussions before about what it means to educate students and to prepare them to function in society. Um, they're not all going to go to college. We should make sure that they're prepared to go to college. But is there any discussion whatsoever about bringing back, I mean, a lot of arts courses or ROP type classes that existed when we went to school that the students no longer get a chance to have the experience to be exposed to and to experience success? And enjoyment. Well, we do it through small learning communities. We have a construction. We have two schools of construction academies. Uh, we have culinary arts. Uh, and again, it goes back to my articulation with community colleges and as well as what we call skill centers. We have various skill centers around around the district as well. Um, when I was in my previous job, I actually sponsored a, a, a maritime, a junior maritime program which is an ROP program that I got the great data support $1,000 to put to, to train young people to be merchant mariners coming out of high school making $30,000, $40,000 a year. And so, uh, to the, but there is something called the ADG requirement. So that goes to the vision. And I didn't, I'm sorry I didn't give you all the vision. The vision was college prepared, career ready. Mm -hmm. So even though you may be in a career tech or ROP program, as, as you all may remember it, you still have to be college prepared. So even if you are taking courses in a construction academy, for example, Santee High School has a construction academy, North Hollywood has a construction academy, and building these trades is trying to get us to put, open up some more. Um, 
you still have to pass the A to G or college prep courses. In other words, we have to link. Uh, if you were studying electricity, then you have to understand algebra, you have to understand Ohm's law, and things like that. And so, to the extent that we take that that the career tech and, and apply the academic piece in, in, within the context of practical uh, knowledge, then in essence, that's the way we're headed. My father was in the culinary arts, but he was he had a bachelor of science degree. Um, because he had to take chemistry, he had to take biology, he had to take all of those courses. Well, obviously, why you got if you're going to be in the food business, why you have to take chemistry? So the bottom line is that's how you start to draw the links that you need while still keeping their interests uh, uh, and, and making sure that they move into something that they really want to move into. We at East LA School Center, for example, we were teaching kids uh, 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 how to be linemen. I had a young man on, on television, KLCS, with me the other day that's going to be a lineman. He's going to be working for, for, for Edison. And he's going to be climbing these poles, you know, uh, when I say lineman, I mean electric, electric, electric wires. So he's going to be climbing these poles. Well, when you go to his class, you see all these formulas and stuff all over the, over, over the blackboard. And so he is learning math in a, in a different way, but still learning math. And, and to be very frank, if he decided that he wanted to go to college, he could transfer that knowledge and go to college. But in the meantime, as a 19-year-old, he's going to be making $70,000 a year climbing these pubs. Okay. So there are ways to work that. And, then, and even in our junior maritime program down in, in Sweetwater District in, right outside of Coronado High School, we, we, the, the, these young people had to take some pretty rigorous academic courses, even though it was related to uh, what we consider to be marine engineering, etc., and, and, and learning how to work on a ship. I guess I agree 100 percent. So my question is, are those conversations you're having with your leaders? Because yes. what, what we're seeing in the school sites, at least, and, and I've been in a couple of them, especially in places where I work in communities where they're ELLs, they're getting beat over the head with English. Yeah. We give them English, and then we give them reading, and then we give them DOWC. And for math, we're giving them math, and, and and it's not an opportunity to do the application. So my question is, are you having those conversations yes. with with those with those leaders in those communities because they're not? Oh, okay. It's very very good. Thank you. Thank you.